So the recording has started. So today we, we will talk about probability. But before we do that, we will have a quick review about what we have, we, have, we have learned in the first unit, that is the two lectures we have done. Uh, what we have done is uh, we've studied exploratory data analysis. We depicted the distribution of a single variable using graphs and numbers. And we also learned how to depict the covariation or the relationship between uh, two variables. One is the independent variable, the other we call the dependent variable using mostly graphs. Now I'm just gonna give you a very quick recap of what we have done in, that, in this area. Uh, we've studied how to depict a single variable, a categorical variable. So notice that uh, you can have two types of descriptions, like numbers to describe the categorical variable. One is frequency, which is how many observations fell into each, each category. And the other is we call it probability. And so for the probability within the sample, it's just the percentage of, of observation that fell for into each category in this particular sample. So in this one, we have 1,200 participants record, reported about their body image. And the frequency is uh, 855, about right 235, overweight 110, underweight. And that can be turned into a percentage by dividing the total and times 100. So 71.3% reported that they thought their body image is about right. And that percentage can also be understood as a probability in that if we randomly choose a, a certain individual from this sample. Let's, let's start, let's stick with sample for now, just from this data, there is 71.3% of likelihood or probability that that particular randomly selected individual will report about right, right? And 19.6% will opportunity that that particular individual from this sample reported overweight. So this is just a very straightforward way of converting a percentage into a probability. And this can, as you can see, it can also be depicted with a pie chart. So there are two things here, frequency to probability. And so these are, these, these, this will repeatedly occur in today's lecture that turning frequency distributions into probability distributions and then we will get to understand probability a little bit better that way. So we can also depict a single variable, uh, a quantitative variable, for example, uh, in terms of numerical values, right? So imagine we have 15 exam grades from uh, 15 students, and those are the grades. And uh, we learn how to create a histogram of these grades. By firstly, we create bins, that is intervals, uh, from smallest to largest, but in intervals of 10. And then we count the number of values within that interval. So there are two values from the 15 that, that are within uh, the interval of 50 to 60. And we turn that count information and interval information into a histogram, okay? And histogram, again, is, is one way of depicting a quantitative variable, the, the distribution of the values. Uh, and this is, we'll come back to this later. Uh, it is quite an important way of depicting a quantitative variable. And later we'll learn how to use a uh, histogram to determine probability. And you will see how it's relevant in terms of probability. We can also, uh, we've also learned to use numbers to depict a quantitative variable. Uh, there are two types of numbers. One, one describes the center, right? Including uh, the mode, the median, the mean. We've learned that this, the center is about the most frequent numbers or the most typical, typical 
numbers within a group of numbers. And the spread is the range or interquartile range or standard deviation described the, the spread the sp from the center, right? How diverse or how close to the center the values in the variable are. And the most, two most important ones are the mean and standard deviation. Okay. We've learned, uh, if we have these numbers, we can use, we can make graphs using these numbers. For example, we can, use, we can make box plots. That is a graph that uses five of the, uh, of the summary numbers. It's including the uh, median, minimum, maximum, and Q1 with the 25, 25th percentile uh, in, on the distribution, and Q3 is the 75% percentile within the distribution. And there's interquartile range with the difference between Q1 and Q3. So, and again, there are different ways of estimating minimum and maximum. And here, what's shown on the, on the, in the image is the uh, 1.5 IQR method. So the minimum and maximum are not actually the actual minimum and maximum values in the data. Instead, those are lower and higher, lower than the minimum or higher than the maximum are considered outliers using this method. We've also talked about the different ways of calculating Q1 and Q3, and there is also a different ways of determining which one is the median. And we also uh, talked about how to depict the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And again, the most important step, the first step is usually to determine what kind of variable it is. It is a categorical variable or is it a quantitative variable? And you do that for both independent and the, de and the dependent variable. Depending on the, their types, you can have different ways of depicting, depicting their relationships. So for CC, right, we, have, we use a two-way table to start. And two-way table summarizes the frequencies of, uh, of data occurring in each of the cells. So for example, in this data, we have 5,375 students answering questions with, of if they smoke or if their parents smoke. So, and that can be uh, summarized with this two-way table. And this produces, uh, this, in this two-way table, uh, it shows the frequency of each cell, and the next step, in order to depict their relationship between parents smoking and students smoking, we have to turn them into a conditional percentage, into a two-way table of conditional percentage. Conditional in, in the sense that uh, it's conditional within each level of the, of the independent variable. And in this case, we're interested in whether parents smoking affects students smoking. So the parents smoking is the independent variable. So we can see that we're basically ignoring the difference between across, uh, the difference within the students that does not smoke or students smokes on the rows. We only focus on the distribution of the frequencies on the columns. So in this case, we have 100% for each column. And then we can, we can see that it seems that for those who parents who the students with their parents smoking, the likelihood of the conditional percentage of them smoking is 20.3%. And when the parents do not smoke, the likelihood seems to be lower, right? It's 13.9% conditional percentage out of 100% in each of the two columns. Now, this is not what we recommended. We always recommend putting the independent variable, parent smoking on the row, and dependent variable on the column. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's confusing to do a two-way table because of you, you always have to ignore one of the uh, two 
rows or column. So sometimes uh, people calculated the percentage within the entire sample. So for, for this two-way table, you can see that the rows do not add up to 100% for each conditions, right? And the columns also don't add up to 100%. Instead, the total add up to 100% on the row and on the column. And this doesn't tell us anything, right? It's, it's quite confusing because now you're dealing with the, the percentages within the entire sample, uh, which is very similar to the, the beginning of, the, of this two-way table is the frequencies, right? So that doesn't really tell us how parent smoking affects student smoking of this two-way table, okay? So you always have to produce the conditional percentage done this way. Uh, so each of the column adds up to 100%. Then we can talk about how the, the difference in terms of relative distribution of student smokes within each conditions of parent smoking. We've talked about uh, how to depict a categorical and quantitative relationship using the type CQ relationship uh, using bo uh, grouped box plots. We've shown how to do a uh, group box plots from the raw data in Excel. And we can also produce uh, a grouped box plot just using those five numbers. We can obtain those five numbers ourselves and then put those five numbers, use those five numbers to draw a, uh, uh, draw these box plots. So in this case, we, these box plot, group box plots shows the differences in terms of calories between different hot dog types, whether the hot dogs being beef or other types of meat or, or poultry see that uh, when it's poultry, I believe that's chicken or birds or ducks. It has to, the distribution seems to be overall uh, towards the lower end of the calories compared to the other two. Right? And uh, there are other ways of depicting this kind of uh, categorical quantitative relationships. Uh, this is just one of the uh, fancier ways that are quite popular nowadays is using different colored labeled histograms. So in this case, you can see that the distribution of the, hist the, the red histogram, whatever it, re it represents, seems to be on towards the high end of on the variable, whatever, whatever that is, compared to the blue histogram. And with the nowadays with the graphing softwares, uh, a lot of graphing software out there allow you to do this kind of fancy plots. Uh, if you're interested, you should look into R. There are certain packages that are such as the ggplot2 package that allows you to make these kind of graphs in any way you want. In the case of a quantitative quantitative variable, we studied, uh, we learned about the scatter plot. So again, each dot represents an observation in the data set and the two variables is being mapped, the value of the two variables is being used to locate that dot on a two-way coordinate. coordinate. Uh, there are some things about scatter plots, plots I didn't really talk about, get to talk about in the, in the previous lecture, that is how do we examine scatter plots. Right? So we can examine, uh, first of all, we can look at their relationships in terms of direction, or form, or strength. So here you can see that X and Y can have a positive relationship or a negative relationship, or neither a positive uh, or negative relationship. In this case, it's more likely to be a curved linear relationship. And we can also look at the form, whether it's a linear or curved linear. But most importantly, we can determine the strength of the relationship by how close or scattered the dots are in relative to the fitting uh, to the regression line. So remember the line is an indicator of their linear relationship, but and the, the degree to which the dots are scattered 
around the, the line indicates the strength of the relationship. So the first graph shows a stronger relation, linear relationship than the second graph, where the, it's more, the relationship is weaker. You can also use it to, to, to see outliers and to, to, to detect the data points that are deviates from the pattern. So again, uh, spotting outliers is, is a very important step in, ter, uh, in during the exploratory data analysis. So here's another example of scatter plot. So we want to look at how weight is affected by height. Right? So we collected height and weight data from 70 of 81 participants, 57 of male and 24 females, and and put it in on a scatter plot. So this seems to suggest that okay, when the height increases, the weight also increases. So that's uh, not so interesting, right? So because you get get taller, you get heavier. But uh, if we label the scatter plot, for example, if we color label this, these dots according to their gender category, I use a blue to indicate the male, red indicate female. Then uh, we're exploring, uh, we, we become exploring not just how height affects weight, but also how this relationship is further affected by gender. So if we fit two lines here, uh, linear lines, uh, equa uh, linear equation here, we can, it seems that the slope, which is the degree of, of tilt, is, seems to be lower for female than for male, okay? And they also, we can also see that males have both higher levels of height and weight than female. But the, what's interesting here is that it seems that for female, uh, the increase of the effect of height on weight is not as strong compared to male, where a slight increase of height seems to be a resulting result in a, a higher level of increasing weight. Now, Notice here that uh, we're not just looking at the relationship between two variables. We're actually looking at the relationship across three variables here. So there is height, how height affects weight, which is, are the two variables that we are interested to begin with. But we also put in gender, right? We are, we are interested in how gender as a categorical variable influences the relationship between height and weight. So again, these are, we have three variables and that's the way to depict them on a screen is that you have height affecting weight, but you have gender pointing to the relationship between height and weight, right? So this is, this is what we call a, a moderator variable. So we're talking about independent variable and a dependent variable. But the directional strengths of the relation between the IV and the DV can be affected, can be further affected by a categorical variable such as gender or race, or sometimes in some cases, quantitative variable. It doesn't have to be categorical. So this is what usually, I don't know if you have heard about this term moderating variable, this is what moderator is. So another example, uh, if you wanna study how exercise affects weight loss, right? You wanna see whether more exercise leads to more weight loss, but you can, you can include a moderator variable called temperature of the, of, of the exercise, in which of the room of the exercise. And then uh, that's a moderating variable. Okay, so, you, so basically you can assume that in the hotter rooms, in rooms that are hotter, uh, exercise lead to, leads to more weight loss compared to in rooms that are cooler, for example, right? So to study this, assuming that we can design some kind of experiment. So if we don't have a moderator, we basically have, we can, we can have design experiment where you have a high exercise group and a low exercise group. You have people running on, and we define exercise in terms of frequency. 
So we have people running on a treadmill in a similar way for 30 minutes, but the only difference between the two groups are that in one group they do it four times a week, another group do it once per week. And we measure the dependent variable. Uh, so this is a semi-experimental design. But if we wanna include another variable in, so we will be including another uh, moderating variable, that is the temperature of the room. So what we would do is that we have the high exercise group, but we further randomly assign participant in that group into one of the two subgroups, right? Within that high exercise group, there are people doing the high exercise in the hot room versus the cold room. Uh, for in the low exercise groups, uh, there are people doing it in the, in the hot room and cold room. And then we have weight losses, but not in not between uh, measured in each of these four groups. Okay, so we have four groups instead of the two groups now. So the moderating effect, uh, first of all, there are two variables being manipulated here. Uh, one is the exercise, which is our main independent variable that we're interested in. The other is the moderator. Notice that moderate in this case is being manipulated instead of being measured as in the case of uh, male versus female in terms of height determines weight. So, and we have two, four experimental groups. It's a two by two design. So we have four groups and it's, uh, we can have uh, between subjects. So it, that like 400 participants are randomly assigned into one of the, these four groups. And what uh, we were hoping to find is, is the so-called interaction effect between these two variables. And this is just a, a depiction of the interaction effect. And again, on the uh, x-axis, we have low versus high exercise. On the y-axis, we have weight loss. And uh, we have color-coded, one is cold room versus hot room. So for, in this case, we show that high exercise seems to result in higher weight loss over how many weeks? compared to low exercise. So this is just, uh, it's, shown, it's shown as a line, but it's actually just really two dots. So the mean uh, weight loss, right? But we also should see that in hot room, there's a difference as well. And uh, we can test whether this difference is stronger than this difference, which looks so. So that it seems that in hot room, uh, higher exercise results in a higher level of weight loss compared to low exercise as compared to cold room, right? So the effect of exercise in hot room seems to be stronger, I would say, okay? So this is what we are looking for uh, in, in our interaction effect. And that can be further tested, statistically tested to, what, to indicate whether this effect is significant or not. Okay, so in today's lecture, we'll, we'll talk about probability, but before that, I want to talk about sampling uh, the basic concept of sampling. And in probability, I want to talk about uh, some concepts related to probability, but we will focus on a normal distribution and using standard normal table to determine probability of, of uh, certain events. In terms of uh, the overview of data production can be summarized in this, in this graph. And uh, we, uh, one, the first important step is, is sampling. So we want to, the production, uh, the production of data starts from sampling from the population. So we study a subset of the population. And then uh, with the data obtained from this sample, right, we do exploratory data analysis. So what we have been learning so far have been only dealing with a finite set of data points, which is the sample data. And then what we eventually want is to make an inference to the population. We want to draw some kind of conclusion about the population. But as you will see that uh, estimating a population with a sample is tricky business. So in that the sample the data we get from sample mean standard deviation will change from, from sample to sample. 
And so we have to use probability as a tool to understand, to quantify how sample statistics change, okay? So that we can, we can achieve some kind of a conclusion that involves a level of confidence and a level of precision when we estimating a population with a sample. Okay? So what we mean by population here is that uh, is the entire collection of people, events or things that we want to investigate. Okay? And the sample is just a subset of the population that we choose to observe. Okay? And, and again, our goal is to, to try to make an unbiased, unbiased generalization, or as we call inference, uh, from the samples to the populations. So the populations can, uh, can mean a, a lot of things determined depending on your research goal, right? So for example, uh, nowadays people are testing vaccines around the world and in that they're doing randomized trials and in that uh, effective vaccine will produce some kind of immunity. So let's say that if we have a sample that we tested and we found an effective vaccine, what is the intended population of these tests, right? So you can say that in the States, if you test in the States, does the population stops within the United States or, so eventually this intended population is the entire human population and not just the entire human population at this, at the particular time and now, but we're trying to generalize to all future gen populations to come, right? So in this case, the, 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 popu uh, the population here is uh, all possible human, uh, not just now, but in the future and in the past, if we get to test them, but it's, that's impossible. So, but in this case, so you can see that the population is infinite. The size of the population is infinitely large and uh, we don't have access to the population. In some other studies where you have a, a particular research question that is pertained to a particular population, then the population might have an affinite size, but it's constantly changing all the time. Right? So what I'm saying then is that we you usually don't have, it's impossible to access to a population and population remains a theoretical concept most of the time. And then we, we want to make an inference, right? So uh, imagine this is, again, this is our sample data from uh, 5,000 students about whether they smoke and whether their parents smoke. So now we want to draw some kind of a reliable conclusion about the population from the sample. So how, uh, so the question becomes, uh, how does the, 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 the data from this sample describe all families with children, if that's the population we want to generalize to? And does it describe well, and, and the question is usually how well does it describe? Okay, we'll, we'll come to that a bit later. And uh, another example here. Right? Uh, so say we want to, uh, companies run uh, this kind of political pools about, uh, about voting. And imagine we have survey 2000 U.S. citizens, and they said they're, they're, they're 47% said they will vote for Trump. And then you can, can we conclude that 47% of all registered voters, right, which is the population you want to generalize to, will vote for Trump. So in this case, 47% is a point estimation in that it provides a point, a single number. But the question is really, how good is this, is this estimation? And, and by, by asking how good, we're asking uh, many questions. First is that, uh, is, it, is it from a, a biased sample or unbiased sample? Okay, that's that's the, the most important question that you ask first. We wanna know what is, what is the sample, where does the sample come from, whether the sample leads to a biased or unbiased estimation. The second question is how accurate? How accurate is, is this 47%? And also how confident can we feel about this estimation? 
Okay. Let's first talk about this question about bias versus unbiased. Because again, this is really the most fundamental question about sampling. So unbiased sampling is quite simple. Uh, theoretically, it's just that each individual in the population has an equal likelihood to be selected. And this can be achieved, for example, by a simple random sampling. And if you ask, how, if you're curious about how randomness is, uh, is achieved, uh, how, this practically, uh, how this is practically done, that's actually quite a com complicated question, how random sampling is actually achieved. And usually it, it, it requires some kind of a randomizing uh, device, like device that produce random numbers or device that can actually give you, uh, achieve some kind of randomization. And you will actually find that this is actually quite difficult to attain. Uh, computer, for example, is pretty bad in terms of dealing with randomness. Okay? And they all, they all, they, a lot of time they have to rely on some kind of external randomness patterns to actually to as, a, as a starting point, uh, such as, uh, for example, a common random uh, initiator is the, the location of the cursor of your mouse on the screen, for example, it sometimes is being used to generate random numbers for, for computers. And some other method, in, including some, uh, I heard that there's uh, one randomizer actually uses the take pictures of the lava that's been released from, from a volcano and using the shape of the lava as, as some kind of a seed of, of randomizer because that's the true random pattern from nature and they use that. So a biased sampling, I mean, other, on, on the other hand, involves creates a situation where some individuals are more likely to be selected than others. Now, uh, the reason for that can be many, there can be many reasons for that, but that's the effect. Uh, if it's biased means that the sum of the individuals in the population are more likely to be selected. For example, this case of volunteer sampling, right? If you ask people to volunteer to, for a political pool, then you already created a biased, biased sampling because those who volunteer may have certain features than those who don't volunteer. So I wanna do a quick exercise. Uh, I'm gonna give you a link. I want, would like you to copy and paste that into your browser, okay? So I'm going to use the chat function to copy and paste the, the link. Okay, so the so this is the first step. So I've shared this link with you. Uh, you should be able to open it. Can you please open it and take a look? Okay, so have you uh, had a chance to open the link? Okay, so if you have opened the link, you would see that they are, you see something like what I've shown on the screen. Give me one second to figure out how to work with the Mentimeter. Uh, so you see this, right? What I would like you to do is to select five circles that actually look representative of all the circles. And then on the screen, it should show you a, an average diameter. Okay, so what I would like you to do is to enter that diameter into the menti.com using the slider. Again, I'm still trying to find my menti. So for some reason, I couldn't find my menti.
but this does require everybody to to contribute so please do so um, I will pause the recording. Okay, so for the second part, what I would, not, would like to do is to create, uh, go to a different link. I'm going to send it, send out on chat. But there's a different link that I just sent you. You open that link, you see it slightly different, like a very similar, but like slightly different, slightly different, uh, Diameter, right? Slightly different uh, graph. Instead of you doing the choice, you cannot select anymore. But you can, you can. What you can do is that the computer will automatically generate randomly select five circles. Okay. So basically, you just click on generate sample, and then the computer will do it for you. Let me just show that. Uh, on the screen. So here's what you would see on the screen. Uh, now you notice that you can't select them anymore. If you click, nothing happens. But if you just click generate sample and it will give you a value, right? I just would like you to enter that value into Mentimeter now. Okay. So six of you, eight of you have entered, yeah? So that's the value that I see on the screen. Again, just generate sample once, and then just enter it, okay? This actually works better with more people. And uh, we only have like 18 people. Yeah, it's a different Menti, like the Menti already progressed. So, so you can notice that the, the, the description is a bit different, saying computer randomly selects, okay? So that's, that's the mentee that I've, it, it's always the same mentee that I've shown on the screen. Okay, we have 15, there's still like three, three people, come on, like 18 participated in the previous one. You cannot enter the mentee. Oh, why would, why would, why would that be? You only need is the code, 81, 22, 44. Or do you mean that, you can't see the, see the. So here are the, uh, the results that from the sampling. So the first one is the average diameter of, of your samples. The second is the mean of the average of, di of, the, of the random samples. And the third is actually the population mean, which is the mean of the uh, diameter of all the circles that were in that graph. What you see here is that it seems that you're, you're overestimating the diameter of the samples by, uh, by quite a lot, quite a large margin, where the, uh, the mean of the average diameter for, from the random sample seems to be closer to the population mean. Okay. So which means that uh, human tend to be biased when estimating what is representative based on what they see in the picture. So uh, wh why are humans tend to be biased? Uh, if you just look at these uh, distribution of different diameters, you can see that the smallest diameter, which you don't really notice that much, actually uh, have the highest amount of uh, counts. So there are 29 of those smaller diameters. There are only one of those 70, uh, the largest diameters, uh, two of diameter of 50, three of 40, seven of 30. So, and when we select, we tend to, what we tend to do is to, to select based on categories, right? We want to include a few from one from each category. And therefore uh, we tend to be, uh, our, our, our sample of five tend to over represent the larger circles and, and under represent the smaller circles. And remember an unbiased, uh, a random sampling means that each every, and every single individual in the population, in this case, 61 circles have the equal opportunity to be selected. And in our biased sample, the smaller, so the smallest circle seems to have lower probability of getting selected 
relative probability than as compared to the larger circles. Okay. So what I'm just showing that is, uh, is a case of biased versus non-biased uh, sampling. And so if, if it's random, then it's unbiased. If it's human involved, usually they tend to create some bias. So, so biased sample is not representative of the population, right? You select one big circle, one shape, a circle each, but the overall distribution within the sample is not the same as the distribution of those circles in the population. And it was systematic under overestimated population. In this case, we overestimated the population. And unbiased tends to be more representative and they're random. Okay? So the random under overestimation you cancel out in the long run. So in some of you give you uh, the random sample still, uh, the average diameter still varies. That's the key, right? Well, sometimes you get 28, sometimes you get 24, sometimes you get 12. But overall, in the long run, if you random sample many, many times, then this kind of random uh, over underestimation will cancel out in the long run. So in the long run, the average of the mean, or the average of the average started to approach the population mean, which is 19.1, okay? So that's unbiased. A classic case of bias sampling leads into biased results. In the 1936, they did a electoral election poll. They have 2.4 million people in the, in the sample of a population of 40 million at a time. And they, based on a, such a huge sample size, uh, they were uh, they predicted that Landon will beat Roosevelt by uh, by a large margin. Eventually, the actual outcome is Roosevelt sixty two percent, Landon thirty eight percent, and that's an error of nineteen percent. Okay, so how did it happen? Because they uh, the way that they send out these uh, these pools is through the uh, is through the uh, contact the phone list or the mail list that are how that's included in a lot of these categories uh, that are or either phone books or something that are used mostly by uh, upper middle class people. Okay, so they eventually, they, they pull, the way they send out their, their the pool is, or, or as you call it, a, a survey, it leads to a biased sample that leads to a biased result. And in this case, the sample size doesn't matter. Okay? The sample size is huge. And large sample size leads to very stable, biased result. Okay? And before we wrap it off for this little segment, I want to talk about uh, the statistic versus parameter. So we, we, from now on, we will call sample statistic, such as mean, uh, x bar is the sample mean, SD is the sample standard deviation, and population parameter, which is the population mean mu, or standard deviation, I think that's sigma, I think? Is that sigma, or? I can't remember what it's called. I think, anybody read Greek letters? I think that's sigma. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'll figure that out during, during the break. So what we're doing is that these are unbiased estimations of population parameter when the sample delta, yeah, I think it's delta. Yeah. Uh, so the, the sample statistic, if it's a random sample, only if it's a random sample, okay? Random samples provides unbiased estimations to the population parameter. Unbiased means that if it's random sample, sampling, and then in the long run, the average of those means will, will approach mu. Uh, average of the standard deviation would approach standard deviation of the population. Uh, so that's that. Again, we talked about sample variability. Uh, if, it's, if it's sample variability means that the sample statistics will change from one sample to another. And the error is defined by the difference between the sample and the population, such as the difference between the population mean and the sample mean. Bias sampling creates systematic error, and that has to be eliminated. And random sampling creates random error. OK, 
Okay, so there was always the difference between the sample estimates and the population parameter. But it's just that with random sampling, with random sampling, the error itself become random and easier to understand. Okay. And can be understood in terms of prob probability. So let's take a break in uh, ten mi ten, for 10 minutes. I'll stop recording. And meanwhile, I'll forward. The okay. So let's talk about probability, right? And the key is that uh, we were talk as earlier, we, we want to, we mentioned that we're estimating population from a sample. Now, the, the key is that we can, we want to make this kind of statement. Like, for example, we have 47% in sample said that they will vote which one. But we want to know that how likely it is that our sample estimate is no more than 3% from the true percentage of all US voters who will vote for Trump, right? So we, we, we know that 47% is not, it's probably going to be off the mark, but we want to know that how, how much it is off the mark, first of all. And second, we want to know that how confident or how likely can we be about this kind of statements that it will be no more than 3% from the true percentage. So this kind of a uh, statement about the population we call it uh, is a, it's a form of statistical inference. And to do that, we, we, we would need to understand one important concept uh, that is probability. Okay? So basically we'll be using probability as a tool to quantify that how much can we can expect the random samples to vary. And the probability, the idea is, uh, is the likelihood of something happening, right? And it goes from 0% to 100%, which is 1.0. And probability questions happens all the time. In real life, like if we ask whether it would rain tomorrow, we are asking for a probability question, right? Whether a stock will go up or not, uh, or go down. So these, uh, or if you roll a pair of dice, uh, how, what's the likelihood that it will roll doubles, right? Or where are we in the lottery, for example? Okay? So in order to determine probability, there are two dive types of fundamental types of ways. One is theoretical, which is also known as classical. The other is empirical, which is known as observational. Now the difference might not be so obvious to someone, uh, to some people, in that a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the probability that we're dealing with have theoretical answers. By theoretical, it means that it can be determined a priori through some kind of a math equation. Okay? And empirical means that we have to actually observe what's actually happening, right? In order to get some kind of empirical probability of certain things happening. And a lot of the times, uh, empirical probability have a theoretical uh, ground in that it, it actually can be determined by some kind of a math formula. For example, uh, if we have a six phase dice and that is equal, that is fair, then uh, mathematically we know that uh, each time we roll the dice we have one out of six of chances each face turn up and we can also do that in an empirically by rolling the dice a thousand times or many many times and observe how many times did each face actually turn up and in, th in this case uh, it can be uh, this is the determine a, uh, a probability of of a dice can be both theoretical and empirical. But in a lot, in some cases, we have empirical probability that don't have a, a theoretical answers. Zoom pres somebody mentioned something about Zoom presentation and it's constantly flashing. Is it just you? Uh, if I unpin my video or if I cancel the spotlight video, what would happen?
So is it, is it okay now or is it still flashing? Okay, okay. So for some reason I could, couldn't find, is my, is my video still showing there? Or I hope my video is showing. Spotlight. Okay, okay. Let me just show this to you as a, as a very simple example, the birthday problem, right? And this is, a, this is an interesting probability question. So suppose that you're at a birthday, uh, at a party with 59 other people, so for a total of 60 people. So what, what do you think are the chances that at least two of the 60 guests uh, share the same birthday? And, and I mean that by same birthday, I mean that date only, like you have the same date. So A is quite small, some, somewhere between 1% and 10%. B is about one out of six. So uh, the rationale for that is as you know, 60 people in 365 days, it's roughly divided as to one out of six. C is about 50% chance. D is quite high, somewhere around 75 to 80% chance. E is very high and more than 99% chance. So let's just, uh, I don't have a Mentimeter for that. Can everybody just quickly tell me on the chat what, what, it, what it would be? I see one person, some people said A. Just give you a, a gut feeling estimate about what is the likelihood. I see A, B, 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 A, a lot of Bs. A lot of people selecting A, quite small. So imagine like if you have 60 people, what I'm asking is that you have 60 people, what are the likelihood that two of the 60 people will share the same day as birthday date only, not year. Okay. Some of you said B, I don't know how many have responded. Uh, give us some thoughts. A lot of you have selected between A and B. So this is just a classic example of how, uh, how uh, problems about, uh, about probability can sometimes be counterintuitive. Like a probability is, is, is usually an intuitive thing, but when it's certain phrased in a certain way, problems about probability can be quite tricky. In this case, the, 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 the right answer is actually E. There's a more than 99% chance that 60 people there, at least, at least two of the 60 guests share the same birthday. So, and this can be determined uh, through two different ways, right? Uh, one, one is through the formula. So uh, I'll show you. So the theoretical way is that, uh, let's say that uh, the probability of uh, n people, n people, or all, all n birthdays share uh, uh, are this the at least at least two of the, out of the n birthday does the same is equals one minus the probability that all n birthdays are different. Right. So you, if you have n numbers of people, you can calculate p bar n, which is the probability that all n birthdays are different equals one times you are taking one day away. Right. So uh, one minus one divided by 365. And then now you take two days away times one minus two divided by 365 until you hit one minus n minus one divided by 365. And then you can get the probability of PN uh, that at least two of the n birthdays are the same. Basically use one minus all of them are different. Okay. So uh, the, uh, for some of you, so you might still take some time to get why is this one minus one minus uh, one times one minus one divided by three sixty five. Not get get to that. Uh, I for most people, this uh, I hope like this will become a little bit more intuitive to you now that I think about it. Yeah? And uh, but the point is that there's a theoretical way that is mathematical equation that you can figure out without having to actually gather 60 people and do it over and over again. So this is the theoretical way of determining probability. And so this is the probability of PN, right? Probability of PN uh, by N. Uh, as you can see, when N reaches 23, the PN will be 50.7. So uh, when you have about 23 people, 
then the, the chance, there's 50, 50 chance that two of the out of 23 people will share the birthday, the same birthday. When, when it reaches 60, the number, uh, the, the, P, the probability of N is already 99.4, just based on the equation that I've just shown you, okay? And when you have 100 people, you're almost like, for sure, there's 99.99997%. Why is the last one n minus one? Uh, because the first one is one. That's why the last one is n minus one. The first one is like, doesn't count, it's like zero. Anyway, the, the, you can figure out that later. I got it from Wikipedia. You can, you can search for the birthday problem on Wikipedia. The point is that, that there's a way of uh, estimating this uh, theoretically, right? The other way is through running simulations, right? And that's fun. Uh, and running simulation is uh, usually called the Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo method is basically a uh, name from, named from Monte Carlo, which is a place for casinos. Uh, is when the gamblers or mathematicians or trying to figure out uh, certain odds for gambling, right? So they use simulation method in order to, to, uh, to calculate the probability. So, and, uh, so they name it Monte Carlo method. And in this kind of uh, uh, simulation will give you uh, observed or empirical probability, okay? So I'm gonna share you a link on, in chat. And this link might actually require you to, uh, to uh, click a link to able to access because this is from the uh, open course. And it might require you to uh, click something in order to be able to in order to be able to, so I'm gonna share that with you. So just give me a second. Uh, quick. Well, I, well, I would like you everybody to do is to, to run 10 simulations with N equals 20, okay? And every time if you see a two somewhere or three, it means that some of the birthday has an overlap, okay? So if, if there's a match equals not non-zero, that means that, that there is an overlap. So I would like you to run 10 times and record every time whether there is an overlap or not. So uh, whether there is an overlap, you say you record one on the text, uh, edit, and record a zero when, it's, uh, when it doesn't have an overlap, and run that 10 times with n equals 20, okay? And then switch to n equals 40, and run it 10 times again and observe the actual percentage of cases where their two birthdays are the same. And then report your results in menti.com, okay? So generate how many birthdays equals 20. So n equals to, that's the n. Generate birthdays, that's the n, okay? I'm gonna pause recording. Uh, to determine probability. And that probability sometimes uh, differ from the theoretical probability, right? And that's, that's our sampling error. That's the random error that each time we get a sample, in this case, sample of 10, our results that we get will differ from the theoretical distribution, uh, the theoretical value that we are supposed to get. Some other interesting simulation that can help us to understand the probability a little bit better uh, there, there's a simulation called flipping coins, which I really like. Uh, let me just share that with you. There's another link for that. Uh, just find that link. So there's another link called flipping coins, coin flip simulation. Here you go, on the chat, there's a link called coin flip simulation that probably require you to click something to go into the website, okay? And I will share with you on the screen. So here you go, this is the probability simulation for coin flip. So the purpose of the probability activity is to experiment with the app applet that sim sim simulates flipping a fair coin and to see if the probability of heads equals 0 0.5. 
as you can see here, there are some certain setups, right? Uh, there's a total flip equals one. There's one flip, 10 flips, four coins. You can increase the number of coins or decrease the number of coins to one. All right, let's just use, and you can see that as you increase the number of coins, the numbers on the axis also increases from zero to eight. And that number indicates the number of heads out of all these coins for one flip, okay? So if you have maximum amount of coins, eight, and probability of heads, this is a priori probability. If it's 0 0.5, it means a fair coin. So if you do one flip of eight, one flip of eight coins or one coin, let's reset that, 10 flips. So if we do 10 flips, and we're showing this eight coins here, we can see a distribution of how many times, how many heads out of the eight coins from the, from the 10 flips, right? So we get once we have all heads, okay? Once we have six heads, three, four times we have three heads out of the 10 flips, three times out of the 10 flips, we have three coin or three heads, two times we have two heads. Now we can do auto and then you just see the number increases by itself, okay? So you can see the total flips increase. And so the overall number also increases. So the, the, the distribution of the frequency also changes, okay? And you can see as the, as the total number of flip increases, this is considered, can be considered as a histogram. And there's a histogram of eight values from zero to eight. Remember distribution is what values can it take and how, how often did it take these values, right? And in this case, uh, the heads can take uh, the number of heads out of ten coin uh, out of eight coins, and take nine different values from zero to eight, and this is how many times do they actually take these values, and this is through a simulation as if coins being actually thrown, right? So now we are approaching a thousand, which is going to pause it at a about a thousand, and we can see we get an empirical distribution that look like this. As you can see, it seems that uh, this is a symmetrical distribution and uh, the average and the mean and the mode and the median all seems to be four, right? And if you think about if we have eight coins, so and if, we have, we, if we have 50, 50 chance of getting a head, the probability is 0 0.5 and this, we should be getting a mean of four, right? So if we're getting on average four heads, right, then it seems to suggest the coin is fair, right? So, sorry that there's an Amazon guy. Uh, okay, so that's, that's coin simulator, okay? You can also change the, you can, you can play it around a little bit to see, uh, change the number of coins or change the probability of making it an unfair coin. But uh, this exercise is just to, to, to show you that this is another way of through simulation, we can obtain some kind of an empirical, empirical distribution of probability. And right now we're just still looking at a frequency, but we can turn that into probability. And that empirical probability uh, seems to somewhat getting closer to the theoretical probability as the total number of repetition increases, okay? Let's go on. So th then we come to the, the law of large numbers. So, uh, so the average results obtained from a large number of trials will be close to the expected value, that's the idea. So, so it requires, a, 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 for example, if you throw a, a dice, you need to throw it many, many times in order to the, to the observe, for the observed average to be close to the theoretical average, theoretical mean. 
Okay? But this does require a large number of repetition. Okay? So in reality, when we have a sample of different individuals, we are assuming that each individual is a repetition. So if we are testing, uh, if we are testing the a vaccine, for example, we test it on, on different people and we want to increase the number of testing uh, the participants so that we can approach what we call not large number of repetition, assuming that each individual is one observation and one repetition. So we need a large number in order to, to get an estimate of, of the population, okay? even with a random sample. And uh, as I said earlier, not all empirical probability can be theoretically described in, uh, with a formula. Uh, for example, there's the very famous Benford, Benford's law, which is also called the first digit law. What they found, uh, what, uh, they found is that uh, in naturally occurring collections of numbers, okay, the first digit, the leading digit, is likely to be small. If they don't have an explanation why this happened, but it just happens to be like that. So to the left, you can see that there's a histogram describing this is the first digit, right? So you have $1,000, the one would be the first digit, like a 2,000, there will be like $20,000, two will be the first digit. So it's regardless of how big, uh, what the number is, the leading digit is tend to be small. Okay, so the number one appeared about 30% of the time, nine appeared to the uh, only 5% five, 5 of the time, right? So the leading digit is much more likely to be one than, uh, than to be nine. And this applies to a wide range of, uh, of data sets, electricity, electricity bills, street addresses, stock prices, house prices, population numbers, death rates, length of rivers, and physical and mathematical constants even, right? And nobody can really explain why this is the case. There's no theory to explain this. But this empirical probability, once you, you have established it, can be quite useful because we have a probability distribution here. And one common use of this is uh, detecting accounting fraud, right? So if, if somebody uh, has an account, have like thousands of transactions, and each transaction comes with a number and it will be recorded in an invoice, right? And by, by comparing, and that uh, a thousand transaction can, uh, can be used, uh, can be called a sample, and we can take the first digit of those 1,000 transactions and come up with a distribution and compare it with the distribution that you see here. So then to determine how much this, this, this sample deviates from this, not theoretical, it's an empirical distribution, uh, but it's very, very useful, right? Then if some, somebody made up all these, all these invoices without knowing this law and make up a lot of numbers, then the distribution of the 1,000 uh, fraud transactions will be quite, look quite different from this particular distribution. Okay? And an another uh, usage that I recently read is that they, because uh, there's uh, this recent uh, co conspiracy theory saying that, that the new coronavirus that's causing the pandemic right now is, is made in a lab in Wuhan, China. And a lot of uh, uh, scientists already uh, refuted that. And how they able to, uh, how were they able to determine that is to looking at the natural mutation, okay? How that changes the certain, uh, how do I say, mutations in the genome, right? to determine uh, what is more likely to change at what spot. And, uh, and then they can compare the coronavirus sample and uh, the mutation of the coronavirus, uh, uh, the, the mutation in the genome map of coronavirus samples, compare that to what they already know is the natural distribution, statistical dist dist distribution of mutation in the genome map. So they basically, by comparing that, they, they were able to determine that, okay, that this is natural mutation instead of anything that's man-made. Because anything man-made will be likely to deviate from the, the, the distribution observed of, of mutation observed from similar virus, okay? So that's also used to, as, as evidence to, to, to determine that, uh, which I recently read was, was quite fascinating. 
Now, before we, we, we talk about probability of uh, flipping coins, of, of doing that, but remember at, at the very beginning, we, we have used a histogram, right? As a, as, a, as a very basic way to determine probability. So uh, in the histogram, in this histogram, we can, uh, we can determine the probability of exam scores equal over 90, right? Uh, as you remember, all you have to do is to divide the frequency by the total frequency equals 6.7%, right? So that probability of, for this sample uh, of exam scores equal over 90 is 6.7%. And you can also determine uh, at least 60, actually uh, at most 60, not at least 60, uh, it's just 20%, uh, at most 60, okay? There's an error in the, in the slides. So which, what I mean, uh, what's important here, you'll be able to determine the probability of, of this, of a score taking certain, uh, falling into a certain range of, of values, okay? Using the histogram as a way of doing that. So we, uh, we can also change histogram from frequency to probability simply by uh, dividing, by changing the y-axis into probability uh, from frequency, okay? So in this case, the shape is unchanged. Yeah, random values can take from minus three, three to four, and, but we changed from frequency to what we call relative uh, probability, or in this case, it's called relative density, okay? So you can see that in this kind of case, uh, relative density, the sum of all the bars, the height of all bars equals 1.0, okay? So it's 100%. So all the bars adds up to 100%, okay? So each bar, now you can see that, or uh, now we can use this to determine, uh, use this probability dense uh, uh, histogram to determine the, pro the easily determine the probability of a random value, okay? Draw, uh, taken from this set of random values depicted in the histogram, taking a certain range of values. For example, we can ask what is the probability of this random variable? Random variable means that it, it can determine in some kind of random methods, okay? uh, like rolling a dice or like flipping 10 coins, that's a random variable. Okay? Uh, taking a value less than minus one, so that's easy. Like we draw a line at one minus one, uh, we want to determine the probability of them taking a the value less than that. We just have to add up all the bars, right? Uh, sum of all the density, which is height of each bar in, in the bins to the left of minus one, it's about 0.3. So it's, it's this 30% of probability that this particular random variable take a value less than minus one. Okay. We just have to sum up all the bars. So the height of the bars can be summed up. So which is quite a neat way of representing probability. Okay, so the area uh, that's to the left of this minus one in this histogram, the area, like bar height is the area, right? They sum up to the value that is probability itself. You don't, you don't have to do any kind of a, a transformation or, prob or, or, or division that gives you the probability, okay? So now let's come to, uh, let's assume that uh, we're dealing with histogram, which is many bars. But if we assume that this is a continuous variable, notice that, uh, which means that the variable can take any value, right? No matter how big or small or how many uh, decimals it take, uh, then the, these like smaller, the bars getting smaller and smaller and to the point that it become infinite, infinitely smaller, it became a dot on a curve, right? So to the right, you see that uh, when you have very, very extremely fine tuned to the infinity, uh, you, you have, what we call a normal distribution, uh, which is a special type of distribution that kind of looks like the, the coin flip uh, histogram we saw earlier, right? It just can become much, much more smooth, smoother. So this distribution, you can take any value between uh, a minimum and maximum and to determine the probability of, of any a random variable fall into a range of values, okay? So uh, this, the normal distribution can have different means, right? So these are two normal distributions of, from two, two separate populations, okay? But they have the same standard deviation, which I'll explain a little bit later. And you can have 
again, these are both normal distributions. They have the same means, right? So the mean is the center of the, uh, in the middle. When it's a normal distribution, the means, median, and the mode are uh, located at the same location. But this one, uh, the red one has a bigger spread, but it's still a normal distribution. And uh, it, because it has a larger standard deviation, okay? So if we take a closer look at the normal distribution, we see that, uh, I'm gonna quickly, let me see the time here. I'm still finished the normal distribution, now we will, we will just, uh, we'll come back after that, okay? Uh, we will we'll finish the normal distribution and then, then we'll take a break. So under the curve, it's, it's one. As I said earlier, it's, uh, they have been transformed into probability. So the, the area under the curve is 100%. If we take a certain value and cut it off, then the size of the area cut off by value A that's under this, uh, un, uh, higher than value A, under the curve is the percentage of the scores of data larger than A. Okay, so this is the di distribution of all possible data. The percentage of scores in the data larger than A is the size of the area. And the same is that the size of the area cut off by B is the percentage of scores smaller than B. Okay, again, this is just a very big histogram, a very fine tuned histogram. Okay, and there's the standard deviation rule. Okay. So if it's a standard, uh, if it's a normal distribution, then there's the famous standard deviation rule that the area under the normal curve, that 68% and 3% of the data would be included in one and a standard deviation above and under the mean. Okay, so the mean is in the middle and the area above and under one standard deviation above and under the mean contains 68.3% of the data. And we've learned earlier, that that's basically the size of the area under this, under this uh, the curve and between one and plus standard deviation. The size of that area is 68.3%. 95.5% of the data was within two standard deviation and 99.7% of the data fall within three standard deviation above and under the mean, okay? And I should, of course, just mention that it's, it's a, this is a symmetrical uh, distribution, okay? And uh, symmetrical around the mean. So, and then this is a, just another way of describing it. So, this is just an example of how, to, how this was determined. I'm gonna quickly go through this. I'm not gonna explain it too much further. This is just shows that the observed is actually, uh, the observed uh, percentage is actually similar to the theoretical percentage that you, you've seen. So you can also reverse the rule in that if you have 95.5% of data, but you wanna determine what's the percentage of data higher than two standard deviation above the mean, then you can just use, or you can, you want to determine what's the percentage of data lower than 2% of deviation below the mean, then you can just use one, 100% minus 95.5% divided by two, which is 2.25%, okay? So the standard deviation rule tells you how much data is within, but you can also tell, uh, you can reverse that to produce, uh, to, in order to estimate what's the, what's the percentage of data higher? Okay, extreme values. What's the percentage of extremely high or extremely low values, right? But that's standard deviation rule. So let's take a, take a break and we'll come back in, uh, so this is uh, in fifth, a quarter after three, okay? And then we'll, we'll work on the worksheet to utilize the standard deviation rule to achieve, to estimate probability of normally distributed data. Okay. I'm gonna stop recording and we can come back after the break. Yeah, does anyone not have the worksheet? Oh, okay. Everyone have the worksheet? Okay. So 
in the worksheet it described that the length of human pregnancy happens to be normally distributed, right? So it has a mean of 266 days and a standard deviation of 16 days. Now with this information and the, norm, uh, the standard deviation rules, we will be able to do, to, to do quite a few things. The first thing is finding the range, right? So let's say that how long does the middle of 95.5% of human pregnancies last? We wanna know that what's the normal range of human pregnancy, right? So we can determine the lower bound and the upper bound using the standard deviation rule, right? So if you look at the, if you look at the standard deviation rule, you can see that 95.5% of data of a normal distributed uh, variable should be within minus two and plus two standard deviation. Okay, and the standard deviation is 16 and the mean is, uh, up, mean is 266. So if we use 266 to minus 16 times two, we will get the lower bound of that, which is, 234, right? And if we use 266 plus 16 times two, we got how many? Two, 298, right? So again, the standard deviation is 16. Okay, the mean is 266. 200 standard deviation, two, two standard deviation below the mean is 234, above the mean is 298, okay? So we now know that the, the middle 95.5% of human pregnancies last between 234, 298 days, okay? Based on two things, first of all, we know that this is normally distributed, therefore the, the the, no, the standard deviation rule applies to this, digit, to this data. Okay, that's important. And then we can use the, uh, if we know the, the mean here, we know the population mean, and we know the population standard deviation, we can, we can do the estimate. The second question is that, what percentage of human pregnancies last longer than 282 days, right? So say we have someone who actually uh, had a human pregnancy lasted for 208 days, uh, 282 days. We want to determine whether that's normal, right? So that's, a little, that's already uh, higher than mean, right? Higher than, than average. But is it, uh, is it normal? Is it like extremely abnormal, right? So we want to determine the percentage to determine whether this is a likely event or unlikely event, how likely or unlikely it is. So in this case, we're looking, given a critical value is, that is 282, right? So 282 is the critical value. And we want to, given a critical value and a distribution, we want to determine the probability of any pregnancy goes longer than that, right? So in this case, we use this critical value and we, we want to calculate how far away from the mean it is, right? So we have, we subtract the mean from the value and divide it by the standard deviation, right? Of 16, which equals one. Point zero, right? And now, we, if you look at the, if you look at the standard de, standard deviation uh, standard deviation rule, so we know that this critical value is located at one standard deviation above the mean. So we know that sixty eight point three percent of the data is located between these one and minus one and plus one standard deviation, right? So we have to use 100% minus that in order to determine what's the percentage of the data that fell out of that range, right? 68.3. And then we notice that this is symmetrical 
And each side takes about that much percentage. So in order to de determine the percentage, the, uh, the, the percentage of pregnancies longer than 282 days, we have, to de we have to divide the total area, which is lower than minus, uh, lower, uh, one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, divided by two, right? So that gives us about 62, 63, 30, two divided by two, I think it's about 15.6%. I, I can't remember. I can't figure exactly out. Eight five, okay, great, All right? So now we are given a critical value that is 282, and we will be able to determine whether how likely or unlikely do this human pregnancy fall in a range that is higher, this range is higher than that critical value, okay? And the third way of using this rule is if we are given a critical value, okay? We want to, uh, if we're given a probability, we want to find out the crit critical value. For example, we want to know that 0 0.15, let's say 0 0.15%, right? So how short are the shortest 0.15% of pregnancies? We want to determine what exactly is normal and abnormal, okay? And we determine that as we choose the threshold if it's like less than 0.15%, it's extremely abnormal if it's shorter than that, right? So, so now we're given the probability, we want to find out, find the critical value, okay? So it is the shortest 0.15%, right? So which means that uh, if it's symmetrical, then we have to somewhat reverse it to one minus 0.15% times two, right? So, so we're interested in the shortest 0.15%, which means that there's another extreme, which is the longest 0.15%, which is symmetrical. And we wanna, if we wanna find out this critical value, we have to consider that. So this gives us 99.7%, uh, right? And now we know that 99.7% of data with, is within uh, three standard deviation above and below the mean, okay? So, so we determined that this is the three standard deviation. So because we're interested in the shortest 0.15%, we basically use the mean, which is 266, minus the standard deviation, which is 16, times three, right? All right, so we have 66 by 48, 218 days, okay? So now we know that any pregnancy that's shorter than 218 days and how long is that? Seven months, like eight days over seven months are extremely short if we consider that as a, as a criteria of, of extremes, okay? So any questions or? So this is three different ways of in which the standard deviation rules are, uh, the, the rule is used to find range, to find probability given a critical value on the data or to find some critical value uh, given uh, some kind of a probability. Okay, and most of the time we care about extreme values, as you can see. Uh, we care about the shortest pregnancies and longest pregnancies because we want to detect ab abnormality. And, and also, and you can also see that extreme values are extremely unlikely. Okay, so this is what normal distribution shows. And um, 
not all normal distribution is just one of many possible dis distributions, and we should happen again to fit a lot of natural phenomenon. I think height also, like uh, the height of a human, is also uh, normally distributed, or roughly normally distributed. I think weight. I don't know if weight is normally distributed or not, but this happens to uh, fit a lot of naturally occurring uh, phenomenon. Such or also like the earlier the flipping of, of of ten coins and the number of heads, that also fits the normal uh, fits into normal distribution. Okay. Now, that's normal distribution. Let's take one step further and talk about the standard normal distribution, which is the Z distribution. So what it does is. First of all, it again the total area on the curve is one or one hundred percent. The area on each side of zero equals one. A zero is uh, a z equals zero is about fifty percent. And this the difference between this and the normal distribution is that it's, it has been standardized in a way that the mean is zero, okay, and the standard deviation is one, and that's sigma. By the way, just checked during the break. That's that's sigma. So mu equals one, sigma equals one. Okay. So now it's not only normal, but it all has been standardized. Okay. So the Z distribution is uh, is very similar in in that uh, to normal distribution. But the catch here, let me just quickly adjust that a little bit. Okay. The catch here is that you can now rely on so-called the Z score uh, in order to determine the probability. Okay, so you can see that the mean is now zero. So we can just describe instead of plus one and minus one standard deviation, we can just say plus one and minus one because now the standard deviation is one. Okay. So again, according to the standard deviation rules, we have 68% of the data, 95% of data under Z, under the curve between Z uh, minus two and plus two, and so on, okay? So you can see that this is turning, all normal distribution can be standardized into a Z distribution, okay? But this is considered as the, the, the standard normal distribution. So now uh, any scores, if, if it's a score that is random, uh, the score is from a random variable that's normally distributed, then uh, it can turn that into a Z score. Okay? So by subtracting uh, the, 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 the mean and divided by the standard deviation. So for example, we, for human pregnancy uh, length data we mentioned earlier, we know that the population means 266, standard deviation is 60. And then we can just turn any score into a Z score. For example, if you 298, can be turned into a Z score of two, right? 242 can be turned into a Z score of 1.5, minus 1.5 because it's below, below the mean, right? So uh, the question we asked earlier now can be just uh, can be solved by referring to uh, Z scores, right? So Z equals uh, minus two can give you the same results that 2.25% of the scores will be lower. Z scores will be lower than that, right? And if a Z score equals plus three, then we know that only 0.15% of the data in the, in the Z of Z scores will be higher than that, right? So this is a, a way of standardized way of looking at, uh, of determining the probability of values falling into a certain range of values for a normally distributed variable. So, well, what I'd like to show you is the Z table. The Z table, I've shared you the, uh, the Z table in the, uh, in the handout, which I will show you, not, which I will bring to the screen now.
Okay, so so now on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the Z table that I shared you earlier. And you can see that a lot of values in the table. And the row and the columns, the first row and the first column is called Z, right? I'll, I'll, I'll go to that later. But what these values are, okay, it's very important to, to be clear about what these values are, are the probability of a normally random variable taking a value less of any given value Z, okay? So on the, on the distribution, on the normal curve, it always gives you, for any given Z value, the probability of the area to the left-hand side of that Z value. Okay, that's the first thing that you do, should understand about the Z table. It always gives you the probability that is smaller than a Z score. Okay, so if you want to determine extremely large value, like uh, then you have to do some kind of reversion okay, of, from, the, from, from that. If we take a closer look, and so this is, and you can see that rows on the left margin is the one and the tenth of the, any Z scores. So here it goes from minus 3.9 to minus 3.5. Remember Z can be minus and plus. And the columns on the top margin is the hundreds of Z scores. So in combination, you can, you can create a Z score that's, that has two digits off after the decimal. Okay, so in this case, for example, if you want to determine a z-score, uh, the area of prob uh, the probability of a z-score smaller than minus 3.74, you, you have to find minus 3.7, and then you find 0.04, and then the intersection you will find the probability is 0.00009, okay? So that's the probability of a z-score falling to a range uh, that is smaller than minus 3.74, okay? So you use the row and the column on the top to determine the exact z-score up to two decimals after, up to two digits after the decimal, okay? Okay, if that's clear, we can then use some, uh, try to use the z-score, the z-table to determine a few uh, scores, right? A few uh, probabilities. So the first question on the worksheet, again, if you still have the worksheet with you, you'll notice that under the exercise two have a few, three questions. So this is the first question on the worksheet, okay? So the first question is ask you to find out the probability of a z-score being smaller than 2.8. So in this case, we already have a z-score, which is two point, smaller than 2.8, which is plus 2.8, okay? So we have to find a z-score, that's 2.8. So if you wrote down the z-score table, If you go to 2.8, and then you will find 2.80, you'll find a number, okay? So, just gonna show you on the screen. So you'll find that this is straightforward uh, because this is what exactly these values means. Uh, the probability of Z score smaller than 2.8 is 0.99744 or 99, 0.74%, okay? So that's, that's clear and straightforward enough, I think. The set, second question, so if you wanna find out the probability of the z-score being less than minus, okay? Know the minus sign here, that minus 1.47, okay? So all you have to do is to find minus 1.4 first, and find a row, and then on the column you find 
0 0.07, and you give out the Z, Z score value, okay? And in the, in the, in the Z table, you find 0 0.07, 078, which is 7.08%, okay? And then you will know that the probability of Z value smaller than one point, uh, minus 1.47 is 7.08%, okay? Was that clear? Because uh, these values are basically percent uh, probability values. Okay, the values in Z scores represent probability. Okay, and you, all you have to do is the, using the Z value, to find exact probability, but that, but that probability is the probability of to the left, okay? So the, the, the area to the left of the z-score. Why do you use the columns again? The column is, is afterwards, right? So the columns are, are fine-tuned. The column indicates the, the, two, the, th uh, the second digit after the decimal. So you can, you can have a z-value up to two digits after decimal, okay? To find minus 1.47, for example, as you show on the screen, you have find 1.4 first, but then you, you go to the seven, right? You go to the seventh, which is to the most right, I think it's seven. And then you have 1.47, okay? That's, that's just the, the columns. Okay, so, uh, so this, this is straightforward, but now uh, what is the prob probability of a z-score being larger than 2.51? Make it larger. Now the question is now, we, we now have to determine the area, the probability, or the size of the area in this case, towards the right-hand side of, of a critical value instead of towards the left. But this requires some, a little bit of a transform, transformation. So we have to make some adjustment of more than problems, right? When the table gives is the default is the, the less than, what we, what we want is more than, right? To the right-hand side. So what we, we can do is the first of all, the Z is 2.51, we find it, the, the Z table tells us that the probability of a normal random variable taking a value less than 2.51, standard deviation above the mean, Okay, it's 99.4%. But if you want to know more than, we have to subtract it by 100%, right? From 100%, which leaves us 0.6%, okay? So the Z-score higher than 2.51 would be one minus what we found in the Z-table. In this case, it's 0.6%. Again, this also still shows that uh, extremely high or low values are extremely unlikely because it only, only happens 0.6% of the time. Uh, I have some other exercises in the, in the worksheet. All right, so there's a third exercise that tells you using the Z score to solve the problems and the Z table to solve the problems of, that we showed earlier for, for human pregnancy. So here it's a little bit limited because we only know a couple of critical values, plus two, plus three, plus one, minus one, minus two, minus three. But what about minus 1.5, right? It didn't really give us that percentage, that probability. And that we can find out in the Z score table. So let's look at this uh, problem a little bit more carefully and see if we can solve this with the Z table, okay? Because we have. So the first, we can standardize any values by subtract the mean from the score and divide by a standard deviation. 
And then we can use the z-score, z-table to find out the probability of the length of any human pregnancy falling to a particular range of values. So we gave up two, two, two questions here, right? The first of all, what would be the standardized score, okay? For length of the human pregnancy of 240 days. Again, to standardize it, we have to subtract 240, subtract the mean from 240 and divide it by the standard deviation 16. The Z score would be, right? minus 26 divided by 16, which equals, let's bring out the calculator, six divided by 16, 1.625, so it's minus 1.62. Six three. Let's round it up to that. So our Z score is one minus one point six three. So that's the standardized score, right? So three hundred days. We do the same. So three hundred minus two sixty six divided by sixteen equals 34 divided by 16 equals 4 divided by 16, 2.13. So that's our Z scores, right? So we now converted the original score, which is 240, 300, into Z scores because we know the population mean, which is 266, and population standard deviation. This is very important, okay? So Z score is only calculated when we know the population mean and population standard deviation, or we have a pretty good idea of what it is. So this is a, a all this this is all under the condition that uh, that condition, okay? And that's something to keep in mind. Now, the next problem is that we want to use the Z table to determine the probability of the length of human pregnancy falling to the range from 240, 240 and to 300 days. So in order to solve this problem, we want to know, because we're asking the range between, right? So we, what we can do is to figure out the, the, prob the probability of of it falling below 300 days first, of lower than 300 days. And now we have the Z score of 2.13. We can go to the Z table, find the value 2.1, 2.11, 2.12, 2 2.13 is 0 0.983, right? So P, I just called P, 300 days. According to the Z table, again, it's 0 0.983, okay? So 98.3%, okay? Now we can also find out a probability of shorter than 240 days. using the Z table, right? So we see the Z scores for 240 is one, minus 1 1.63. So we go to minus 1.6, minus 1.6. Oh, okay, I just realized that I have miscounted one of the scores. So it starts from zero, 2.10123, 3, 4, 1. 3, 4. Okay, so 
Again, for 240 days is minus 1.63. We find one minus 1.6, 0, 1, 2, 3. We got this value, 0 0.05155. equals 5.12%. So we have these two probabilities here and the range between so larger than larger than 200 p let's call it x larger than 240 days and smaller than 300. Okay, so this is X lower than 300. One six, oh yeah, sorry, 5.16. So now the range is just the first value because remember this is to the left, so we subtract it and then we can determine the range which is 93.18%, okay? So now we know that there's 93.2% of probability that human pregnancy fell into a range of 200, from 240 to 300 days. Okay, so that's the Z table. Okay. So yeah, we, we've covered quite a few things today from the basic idea of what is probability, how probability can be determined to using this kind of a, a curve uh, from histogram and move on to this kind of a curve, continuous curve to represent probability. And the uh, probability is, is represented as the area under the curve, right? And a few things uh, to, to mention before we wrap it up. This, this curve is called a density, density function, okay? And for any density function, not just, this, this is the density function for standard for a uh, normal standard distribution, standard normal distribution. But there are other distributions that are shapes look different from this. But the, but the idea is the same, okay? The area under a density function curve and cut off from a certain value, okay, as, the, as shown on the screen, is the probability of of that random variable taking the value less than that critical value, okay? So the area always indicate a, prob a probability when it comes to when the curve is a density, density function of a distribution. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and that's that, and that's, um, that's one of the most basic things about the statistics. Uh, why? You will see that in hypothesis testing, okay? And uh, what are a few other things to, to note is that uh, the, this normal distribution tells you like extreme values are extremely unlikely and most values are in the middle, right? So most values are close to the mean. And the further away from the mean, the less likely it becomes uh, for that value to appear. That's something also to keep in mind. So like very hot, tall people are, are very uh, rare, right? So this, this is why uh, normal distribution describes a lot of norm, uh, nat uh, natural phenomena, okay? So that's it for today. Uh, next lecture, which is Monday, we will talk about sampling distribution. We, we talked today about how sample, uh, how sample statistics like means and standard deviations will change from one sample to, to another sample, right? But we didn't really talk about how it will change and how do we quantify 
this kind of sampling variation. So in, in the next lecture, we will, we will start to quantify exactly how a sample of a certain sample size n, okay, will tend to vary among the population mean if we know the, the population's mean and the population standard deviation. We'll be able to quantify how a sample mean, a sample standard deviation vary among the, 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 the population mean. So that's what we learn in the next lecture. So that's it. I'm going to stop recording. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, you can ask me. Okay.